We've been studying in the book of Daniel recently. And so if you open your Bibles to the book of Daniel, to chapter 3. A Sefer Daniel ve Perek Shalosh. We want to study in chapter 3 of the book of Daniel today. Now, you know that the book of Daniel is a short book. It's only about 12 chapters. And we will probably go through the book of Daniel very quickly. But we don't want to go too quickly and miss the lessons that are important to us. The lessons that the Lord would have us to learn. You may recall that in the first chapter, Daniel and many of his friends were taken away captive by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, conquered both Egypt and he defeated Paro or Pharaoh and the Egyptian army and then after he defeated them he came up and conquered Jerusalem because Yerushalayim, Jerusalem had been conquered previously by Pharaoh. And so Nebuchadnezzar when he conquered Yerushalayim he took many of the people captive and he took them away to Babylon for what the prophet Yeremiah or Jeremiah the prophet Yeremiah Hanavi had said would be 70 years of captivity. They were taken away captive because of their idolatry because they had worshipped other gods. They were taken away captive because they had not given the land its rest every seven years as they were supposed to in the Word of God, in the law, in, in the Torah, in the law of God. And so they were taken away for 70 years captivity into Babylon and away from Yerushalayim. And the first chapter documented their new life in Babylon. And the first chapter mentioned that their names had been changed from the Hebrew names that they had had before. And the Babylonian people, King Nebuchadnezzar and his chief security people and the captain of the eunuchs changed the names of Daniel and three of his friends. And they changed them to Babylonian names that were meant to somehow talk about the Babylonian gods, the false gods of the kingdom of Babylon. And then in chapter 2, you may remember that the king had a dream. And so he brought all of his wise men in, all of the magicians, all of the scholars, all of the Chaldeans, and he said, I want you to tell me the interpretation of the dream. But he knew that if he told them the dream, that they would just make up some interpretation. That they would say anything to keep the king happy. And so he devised a plan. He made a plan. And he says, I want you to tell me the interpretation of the dream, but I am not going to tell you the dream. You have to tell me the interpretation of the dream and you have to tell me the dream. In this way, he knew that they really were supernatural and they really were very, very wise men because they knew these hidden secrets and the thoughts of his mind. But of course, none of their wise men could tell the king his dream. They were ready to tell him the interpretation. But none of them had wisdom from God to tell him what the dream itself was. And so the king was very angry with the wise men and he sent out an order to have all of the wise men, 
all of the sorcerers, all of the magicians to be killed. Well, Daniel and his friends that had been carried away captive into Yerush in, from Yerushalayim into Babylon, Daniel and his friends were also to be killed. And when Daniel had heard about it, he told the captain of the king's guard, he says, well, wait, just give me a little bit. Give me a little time. And we will pray about this and we will ask our God, who is the true God of heaven and earth, and he will reveal the king's dream and its interpretation. So you may remember over the last couple of weeks we talked about the dream and the interpretation and indeed when Daniel and his three friends prayed, God gave Daniel the interpretation and he told Daniel what the dream was. And so when Daniel came before the king and they had stopped killing the wise men long enough to see if Daniel really had the dream and the interpretation. Daniel came before the king and he told them the dream that the king had and he told them the interpretation that the king had. This really impressed the king. Even though he was the king of all of the world at that time. He was the king of the first major empire that included all of the civilized world at that time. And yet after Daniel tells him the interpretation and tells him the dream, the king of the world falls down before Daniel. And he says, your God truly is the true God. And that was the story of chapter 2. And we read in chapter 2 that the king had been laying on his bed that night before he dreamed and he had been thinking about what would happen after he left? Because you know, people don't live forever on this earth in these bodies. And the king was probably getting older at this time. And it said to us in the Bible that as he lay there on his bed, in chapter 2 it said to us, that he was asking himself and wondering what would happen after the days in which he was king. And then God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream, a vision in the night. And God had showed Nebuchadnezzar a great image, a very tall, great image. And the head of that image was made of gold. And the arms and the chest of that image was made of silver. The belly and the legs or the thighs of that image rather was made of bronze. And the legs from here down were made of iron. And the feet were made of iron mixed with clay. And Daniel interpreted the dream to the king and he said, You, O King Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. But after you there will be a kingdom not as pure as yours, not as centrally controlled as yours. It wouldn't be altogether organized as good as yours. And it would be made of silver and that would be the Medo-Persian kingdom. And after that there would be another kingdom made of bronze, which is a less valuable metal. It's not as expensive as silver, and the silver is not as expensive as gold. But the bronze kingdom would be the Grecian Empire from Greece. History shows us that that was Alexander the Great. And then after the Grecian Empire, there would be another empire that would break into pieces everyone that came against it. And all of the countries that tried to resist it, this last empire, which was made of iron, would be the Roman Empire, which would then conquer the entire world, but eventually it would be destroyed 
by a rock that was cut out of the mountain without human hands. And that stone would fall upon the feet of the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw. And all of the kingdoms of men that had been described in that image, the head of gold, the arms and the chest of silver, the belly and the thighs of bronze, and the legs of iron, and the feet of iron and clay, all of man's governments over the entire world would be destroyed. As this stone cut out of the mountain without human hands falls upon the feet of this image. Well now with that background we get into chapter 3 of the book of Daniel and as we usually do this we're going to read in chapter 3 very quickly I'm going to read the chapter to you. Now if you have a Bible in Hebrew now is the time that you want to open that Bible to Daniel chapter 3 and read all of Perak Shalosh, or the third chapter of Hasefer Daniel, the book of Daniel. If you have a Bible in Russian, you should open that up and read in your Bible all of chapter 3 as I read this to you. Same thing if you have a Bible in English. It says in chapter 3 of the book of Daniel, in verse 1, that Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its width was 6 cubits. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all of the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all of the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then a herald cried aloud. And he said, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the middle of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time when all of the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and symphony with all kinds of music, all of the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They accused the Jewish men and said to the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a command, a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whosoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. But King, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke to them, saying, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods 
or worship the gold image which I have set up. Now if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre and the psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music and you fall down and you worship the image that I have made, then good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the middle of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand O king but if not let it be known to you that we still will not serve your gods nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he spoke and he commanded that the heat of the furnace be increased seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the fiery burning furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and they were cast into the middle of the burning, fiery furnace. And therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was very, very hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the furnace. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, tied up, and bound in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. But then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in hurry, and he spoke, and he said to his counselors, Did we not throw three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, Yes, king, that's true. And he said, But look, I see four men loose and walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and he spoke saying Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the middle of the fire and the satraps, administrators, governors, and king's counselors gathered together and they saw these men on whose body the fire had no effect. And the hair of their head was not even singed or burned. And their garments were not affected. Their clothes did not even smell like fire. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And he has frustrated the king's word, and they have yielded their bodies so that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be cut into pieces and their house shall become a pile of ashes because there is no other God who can deliver like this. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. It's an interesting story that we've just read. In fact, it's a story that I remember learning as a little child. 
It's a story that's taught to the children in all the places if they are Christian or if they are Jewish. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is one of the greatest stories of the Bible. It's a story of God's faithfulness to care for the people who trust in Him. The people who rely on Him. But many people remember the story as the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I prefer to remember the story using their Hebrew names. I prefer to remember the story as the story of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Because you may remember that when the young Jewish men were brought to Babylon, that the king had their names changed. But in Hebrew, as you may know, names mean something. In English, they don't necessarily mean something. I mean, sure, you could look at someone's names, uh, maybe Johnson, and you say, well, that's the son of John, just like Ben Yehuda is the son of Yehuda, or the son of a Jewish man. But in Hebrew, the names have meaning. If I say Avi, everybody knows that his name is my father. Ima, mother. You know, my great-grandmother was Ima. And she was the mother of our family. My grandfather was Yaakov. And he was, well, I don't know if he was the deceiver in our family. But he lived to be 93 years old and he was a smart man so he knew some secrets. But in Hebrew the names mean something. And as we looked at the names that these young men had, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Hebrew names that they had were Hananiah, which is God is gracious or beloved by God. God is gracious. God is full of grace. God is gracious to me. Mishael, in biblical Hebrew, that meant who is like God. There is no one like God. Who is like our God? Who is like God? And then Azariah, you may recognize part of Azariah. It sounds something like Ezra, Nahon. Something like Ezra, the prophet. Ezra was help or helper. Azariah, Yah on the end, was the name what we call Hashem today. Azar, Yah, is God is my help. God is help. He is the one who helps me. So Hananiah, God is gracious. God gives grace. Mishael, who is like God. And Azariah, God is our help. And now they've changed their Hebrew names to the Babylonian names, which were, of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, Shadrach was simply, it simply meant that he was inspired of Aku, which was a Babylonian god. He changed his name to mean that he was inspired now by a Babylonian god. Meshach simply meant that who is like Aku, the Babylonian God. So instead of Mishael, who is like God, it's now Meshach, or who is like Aku, the Babylonian God. And they changed their names. Abednego, you may recognize that if you're a Hebrew speaker today, Ebed is the word for servant. Ebed Sadiq is the righteous servant that we read about in Isaiah chapter 53. But now this Aramaic word that they used at that time was Ebed, which is similar. And probably much of the Hebrew part of that word came from the Aramaic culture being a slightly older language. And we know that uh, there's quite a bit of the Hebrew uh, vocabulary that came from Aramaic roots in the early days. But Azariah, or God is my help, became in Babylonian Abednego, as you would say it in English, which means a servant of Nego. 
which was another Babylonian god. Now the interesting thing is, is we see these young men today and we see that their life is on the line. If they do not fall down and worship the false god that the king has made, then they will be killed. They will be thrown into the middle of a fiery furnace and the king is so angry with them that he has now had the furnace heated seven times hotter than it was before. In fact, as men were taking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Haniel, Mishael, and Azariah, as they were taking them to the fiery furnace, the men who were taking them there were overcome by the flames and killed by the fiery furnace. That's how hot the furnace was. And the three young Jewish men knew that they would be killed if God did not deliver them. They knew that the command of the king had commanded them to worship this false god, this false image, and that if they did not bow to this image, if they did not follow the king's instructions, that they would lose their life. And even though they had been named these Babylonian names to indicate that now they were servants of Babylonian gods, in their heart they knew who they were. In their heart they knew that they were still Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They knew that the Babylonian names did not matter anything because it's who you are in your heart that matters. It's what you do with your hands, with your life. It's who you believe in in your heart that counts. And so they said, we don't care if we die. We're going to believe in the one true God that made heaven and earth. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Echad, Ein Meshocher. There is nobody else. There is no other true God. He alone is God. The Lord our God is God. The Lord our God is one. That's the Shema of Israel. It says, Listen, O Israel. The Lord your God is one. The Lord our God is one God. And so they were not willing to sacrifice to this false God by worshiping this image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, let's talk about that for a minute. Because there's a lot of people who believe today in Judaism. There's a lot of people who believe today in Christianity who believe in the true God of the Tanakh or the God of the Old Testament if you're English. But when it comes to having persecution, they sometimes make compromises in their lives. And sometimes they try to rationalize things and make something that makes them feel good but yet gets them out of trouble. You know what I mean? Sometimes people, I mean, they could have said Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael could have said, well listen, if we die, then we're not doing God any good. But if we live, then we can see people in the kingdom and secretly tell them about the true and living God. So isn't it better that we should live? Isn't that just the way we think so many times? They try to say, well, I can still serve God in this way. And nobody will know it will be a secret. And we'll, be, we'll be talking to all of the people about the goodness of the real, true, and living God. And no one will know. We'll be secret agents for God. You know? Dun, dun, da, da, dun, dun, da, da. We'll be secret agents and no one will know that we believe in the real God. But we'll be working for Him in the shadows where no one can see us. The problem is is God doesn't have any secret agents. 
God says in the book of Proverbs that He hates deception of any kind. You are who you are. What you say comes from the heart that is in you. Yeshua taught us this. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You don't want to try to deceive people into thinking that you're something that you are not. You don't want to try to make believe for any reason, even if it sounds like a good reason, that you are working for God while you are denying Him. Yeshua made the line very clear. He says, you're either for me or you're against me. Joshua had said the same thing after the death of Moshe. As he's speaking to Am Israel, the nation of Israel, he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether this or that, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord God. You do have to make a decision. And Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, by their Hebrew names we'll call them, had made a decision in their heart that they were not going to deny God. That they were going to stand for Him even if it cost them their life. Well now sometimes you and I make compromises when it doesn't cost us our life. Maybe someone just thinks we're strange. I got news for you. They thought I was strange before I was a believer. You will always have people who think you're strange for believing in the Lord God. You will always have people who make fun of you for being a believer in the Lord God and believing in His Mashiach, Yeshua. You will always have that. If you're Jewish today and you're religious and you don't believe in Yeshua, you know already that you will still have people make fun of you because you believe in God. Because the world today is very godless. But people will really make fun of you. People will really cast you out. People will really not like you if you believe in His Mashiach, Yeshua. But if you look at the lives of all of the prophets in the Tanakh, you will find that none of them were accepted by the people in their days. They were all rejected by the people. Even sometimes the kings would have the prophets killed. And the prophets of God who did not apologize for bringing the word of God would suffer persecution. And I'm not talking about from the Goyim, but from the Yehudim, from Am Israel, and from the Malachim, from the kings as well. They would suffer persecution. Not everybody hated the prophets. Of course, there was a remnant of people, there were godly people who listened to the Word of God, who believed in the Word of God, and who did not worship idols. But there were people, and a majority of the people worshipped the idols. And a majority of the people went away from God. Today it's easy to go away from God. Today it's so easy, isn't it, to fall in line with the rest of the world. It may not be Nebuchadnezzar who's telling us what to do and how to deny our God and telling us to do this instead. It may not be a king. It may not be a ruler of a land. It may not be a prime minister. It may just be a friend. It may be someone else that's telling you how to make a small compromise in your belief of the living God. But I think today the lesson of Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael should be something that we remember in our heart. Look at how brave these young men were. They knew. 
God had not told them that He would save them from the fire. They did not know. They answered Nebuchadnezzar and says, King, there is a God who can deliver us from your hand and it's God, the God who made heaven and earth. The only true God, the Lord God Almighty. He is, he is the greatest. He is the only true God who made everything. And He can deliver us from your hand. But, Nebuchadnezzar, King, we respect you because God put you on your throne. But if He does not deliver us from the fire, you can still know that we will only worship the true Lord God Almighty who made heaven and earth. We're not going to worship your image. Now, it's an interesting thing, this image. You remember that we read today that the image was all made of gold. Does that ring a bell? Do you remember something there? Chapter 2, what was the image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about? It had the head of gold. It had the arms and the chest of silver. It had the belly and the thighs of bronze and the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. And when Daniel gave Nebuchadnezzar the king the interpretation, he said, You, O king, are the head of gold. But after you there will come another kingdom that's not as pure as your kingdom. It's not as it's not controlled from the center like yours is. And after that there will be another kingdom that's even more worse or more inferior than the kingdom of silver with the arms and the chest of silver. And then after that we go from silver to bronze to iron. Well, iron's not worth a lot. And so they start getting worse and worse and worse, but they are still kingdoms that ruled the entire world. Now, we're not talking about kingdoms that rule just a region. We're not talking about kingdoms that had only conquered Israel. We're not talking about kingdoms that had conquered five or six or ten countries. We're talking about kingdoms that ruled the entire world. And they were, at the start, Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by the Grecian Empire, followed by the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, even though it had smaller military defeats here and there, was never defeated by another worldwide kingdom. There has never been another kingdom that had the entire world in its kingdom like there was during the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman empires. So the Roman Empire just ceased to exist and fell apart and there has never been another kingdom over all of mankind like there were in those days. But Nebuchadnezzar listened to Daniel as he gave the interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar heard that thing that Daniel said, You, O king, are the head of gold. So now what does he do? He makes an entire image. And it looks kind of like the image that he dreamed about. But the whole image is gold. Right? There's no more silver, there's no more bronze, there's no more iron, there's no more iron mixed with clay on the feet. The old image is gold. Now we know from Daniel chapter 2 verse 29, as Daniel told the king his dream, Daniel said, you, O king, were laying on your bed at night. And you were thinking about what will happen after your kingdom. After you are king, what will happen next? Well, Daniel, when he interpreted the king's dream, he says, after you there will come another kingdom, and then another, and then another. Nebuchadnezzar did not like that. 
He wanted all of the image to be the image of gold. He did not just want to be the head. He wanted to be the arms and the chest. He wanted to be the bellies and the thighs. He wanted to be the legs and the feet. He did not want His kingdom to end. Because as you went from the head down to here, down to here, to here and to the floor, to the feet, time was passing by. Time was continuing on and Nebuchadnezzar thought, well, I don't want my kingdom to end. So I'm going to make an image. I'm going to say that this image that my hands make is God and it's all going to be of gold so that I will have the kingdom forever. And Nebuchadnezzar was going against the prophecy, the vision, the dream that God had given him that night. And so he made this image out of his own hands. And because he's the king, he gathered everybody in front of this image in the plain of Dura. And the plain of Dura was the only place big enough to hold everyone who was supposed to come and bow down before this image. But you notice that the king knew that there would be some people who would not want to bow down before this image. And so he said to them, he says, when you hear the sound of all these instruments, when you hear the sound of all this music, you are to bow down and to worship this image which I, Nebuchadnezzar, have made. But then he did not stop there. He said, if you do not, then you're going to be thrown immediately in the pizza oven. And you're going to burn up. You're going to be thrown in this big fire that I've made, this fiery furnace, and you're going to die. So it's kind of like the king is saying, hey, why don't you come to my house for dinner tonight? And if you don't, I'm going to have my horses tied to each arm and we're going to tear you in half. That's kind of the way the king did business in those days. He was a very mean king. He was a very cruel king. We read historical accounts and things in the Bible and it seems like he was always threatening somebody to cut them up in pieces and to burn their houses down with their families. And now he's threatening to throw them in this burning, fiery furnace. And so everybody, when they heard the music, they said, well, uh, I don't want to go to the furnace. And they fell down. And they worshipped the image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But there were a few people who did not worship this image of gold that was made by man's hands. There were a few people who worshipped only the true living God of heaven, who made heaven and earth, who remembered the command that you shall have no other gods before me, that you were to worship the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, with all your soul. And they remembered this command and they said, we're not worshiping the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. And then after that, some men came to Nebuchadnezzar the king and we're told in this chapter today that it was the Chaldeans that came to Nebuchadnezzar the king. And they're saying, King, didn't you say that anyone who did not worship your image would be cast into the fire? And the king said, yes, that's right. And they said, no, nah, I see. Well, uh, King, did you know that some of the young Hebrew men that you brought from Yerushalayim, they're not worshiping your image. They are not bowing down to your God, O King. So what are you going to do? And the king had these men brought to him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. He had them brought before him. And they said, is it true that you are not worshipping my God, my image? And they said, that's true. He said, I'll give you one more chance. If you worship it and you bow down, then I'll let you go. Everything's okay. But if you don't do as I said, 
and you continue to worship only your God and listen only to your God, then you will be cast into the fiery furnace. And then he says, and who will deliver you from my hand? Now, I'm sure that as these three young men are standing in front of the king and they hear the king say, and who shall deliver you from my hand? Azariah, whose name means God is my helper, is thinking, well, that's an easy question. God will deliver me from your hand. Nonetheless, they knew because this had been broadcast and everybody knew what was going to happen and they had already planned in their heart not to worship the idol that the king had made. They knew that they were only going to worship the true Lord God Almighty who made heaven and earth, the God of the Jews. And so when they answered the king, they said, it may be that God will deliver us from your hand and from the furnace. And by the way, king, he can do that. He's God. Yes, you're a mighty king, but he's God. You rule over a land. You rule over these countries. God made the earth in which these countries exist. And He made the heavens and the earth and everything else that is. He can deliver us from your hand. But if He does not, then still we will not worship your image. Well, at that time, Nebuchadnezzar was not about to give them any more chances. That was the end for Nebuchadnezzar. He was now very angry. And he commanded to heat the furnace seven times hotter than before. And he had them thrown into the middle of it. Isn't it interesting that sometimes you and I tend to try to compromise our faith for small things. No one's threatening us with death. No one's threatening to throw us into the middle of the fiery furnace. The king is not threatening to kill us and everybody that we know. But someone is simply saying that you're weird. Or they're saying you're strange. Or they don't like us or they don't talk to us anymore. Or they don't want to be around us anymore. And we go, oh... That hurt my feelings. Maybe I should make a compromise here. Because after all, I still need to be with them and then I can tell them about God. And over time, I can change their mind about how they feel. I want you to consider something. When Yeshua was in the world, He says, I am the light of the world. As He was about to leave the world, He turns to His disciples, He says, you are the light of the world. If you are a light, if you are a candle, you can only give light to somebody if you don't cover it over. But if you light the candle and you put something over it, it doesn't matter how much light you give because nobody can see it and nobody can see the witness of God in your life. And there are no compromises that we are to make about the Word of God. We are here for a purpose. Yeshua said, if you are ashamed of me and my name before this adulterous and perverse generation, then in heaven before the angels of my Father and before all there I will be ashamed of you. Now these are very hard words. He's done so much for us. How can we be ashamed of Him? God has no secret agents. I love this story because at the end, God did deliver them out of the burning, the burning fiery furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar himself, I can see it now. He gets up from his throne. He's looking and goes, I'm still mad at those guys. Yeah, burn them in the middle. Okay, now good. They're thrown in the middle of it. Oh, well, wait a minute. They should be falling down by now. What's going on? And he gets up closer to look and he goes, 
uh, didn't we throw three men in there? How come I see four? And the fourth looks like the Son of Man, the Son of God. And they're walking around. And nothing is happening to them. Nothing is wrong. And Nebuchadnezzar forgets about being the king and he goes up to the fire as close as he can get. And I'm sure it's like singeing the eyebrows. I used to cook hamburgers in America. And I love turning those hamburger pies. They make this big fire, you know, when you turn them over. And all that water on top and it go like a big explosion. I just love doing that. I'd get home at night and I'd see my eyebrows were all singed and only half of the hair was still there. But I sure had a lot of fun. But Nebuchadnezzar probably got so close to the fire he could feel the heat. And he goes, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, is that you? And now he's their friend, you see. And uh, who's, who's your friend in there with you? Hey! Why doesn't everybody come out? Let's talk. <laughs> and so anyway, you know the story. He tells them to come out. They come out and Nebuchadnezzar falls down and says, Your God is the true God. Now, now consider this. If they would have been secret agents of God, Maybe they would have talked with someone here and there in the shadows, behind the door, at the side of the building, and they would have hidden the fact that they were believers in the true God who made heaven and earth. They would have saved their life and they would have convinced themselves they were God's secret agents. And a few people would have heard. But because they did not compromise, the king of the world heard. Amen. And then afterward, he commanded the entire empire of the entire world that God, the true and living God, was the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that there was no other true God. When we don't compromise for God, he takes us before princes, before kings, before people, and if we're faithful witnesses, He will take us before them and do great and mighty wonders. Amen. Lord God, I want to thank You for protecting us in the middle of the fire. And Lord, sometimes You do allow for harm to come to us. But even at those times, your name is glorified. Because we can face those trials. We can face the hardship knowing that we've been faithful witnesses. And Lord, the strength does not come from ourselves. But even that strength comes from you. And you will put your spirit upon us and you will give us the strength and the courage to go to places that we would not take ourselves without you. You, O oh Lord, are our strength. You said it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by your spirit, O oh Lord. Lord, I confess we are weak. I confess that without you, we would fall down like everybody else. We would make the compromises like everybody else. And even at times when we would try to honor you, we would be weak and we would fail. But when we leave our lives in your hands, in your hands alone, when we don't trust in our own power, in our own wisdom, but we trust in your word, you will see us safely through. And your name will be glorified. Lord, you said in your new covenant, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, 
that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, that's a bold message. I pray, Lord, we never compromise it. Give us strength. Give us power. Lift the coverings that we place over our candles, over our lights, that it may give light to all around us as we stand close to you and reflect your light, your glory, that all may see, that all may know you, that all may have everlasting life. Hashem Yeshua, Amashiach, Ani Amen.